This presentation is not necessarily, I have some maybe, I don't know if advice would be the right word, but what I'm gonna tell you about is I'm gonna tell you about my journey. My journey, it got me to mob programming. And it started um, shortly after I graduated from college when I encountered this book, Code Complete. We have any Code Complete readers out there, right? So, um, very early influential book in my career. Um, and one of the things, one of the practices that uh, Steve McConnell in Code Complete espouses is this idea of a code review. And again, having been in school, we didn't really do those types of things. And so I thought this was kind of interesting. And so here's, here's a little bit of a, a snippet from, from that book where he talks about code reviews. Now if we kind of uh, slice out a little bit of it, we have things like at least three people read every line of code. We have programmer leaves the project, kind of um, providing a safety net for that. Uh, programmer knows that the code will be read by others and we're moving towards a group coding standard. For me, this sounded like, this is great, right? This is like things that we really want to have happen. And so, um, early on in my career, we did code reviews. And we're kind of in this modality, right? Everybody was solo programming, but you would kind of asynchronously do code reviews. Um, perhaps sometimes we would have people get together. Um, sometimes it was just a, hey, could you go review this? And then you'd send some feedback, uh, either an email or some other functionality. Uh, we didn't use a formal tool, we didn't have GitHub back then uh, to do kind of pull request type flow with code reviews, but um, it was this kind of asynchronous thing. Uh, who here does code reviews of some sort? Okay, so when you do a code review, well, let's see. So there's some benefits, right? Obviously, people are doing it because there are benefits, presumably. Um, Right, we get that, it allows us to get help from other people, right? We can, it's redundancy, so more people are looking at the code, presumably, and so therefore there's not like a single point of failure. Um, one of the challenges, though, with, with, uh, with code reviews is, is this problem that highlighted by Dilbert. So oftentimes, code that is written in isolation is so bad that um, the code will win when you're reviewing it. Um, it's not, not ideal. <laughs> so with, with Dilbert, right, I mean, this is kind of obviously exaggerated. Um, probably more common, though, is, is a situation like this, where the person who's writing the code knows that somebody's going to review it. So they're like, well, I don't have to be as careful as I need to be. The person will review it, and they'll catch stuff. And the reviewer's like, oh, that person, that they're probably really careful, so I don't really need to review it that closely. And so we have this disconnect that happens. Um, additionally, right, with code reviews, how fast do you get a code review back? Two what? Days. Two days, okay. What else? Two weeks. Two weeks? <laughs> okay. A week. Yeah. A week. Anybody got lower than that? A couple of hours. So I've, heard, I've yeah, I, usually the lowest I hear is maybe a couple of hours, um, up to a couple of weeks, right? Um, so the thing is, is that with our brains, um, what happens when you, as a programmer, finish your thing and you send it off for code review? Do you keep thinking about that thing? What do you start doing? Next thing. You start thinking about the next thing. Right, so even if it's two hours later, um, I'm thinking about the next thing, and I get this interruption that says, oh, there are things that you need to change about that thing that in your brain you've kind of declared as done, right? And so there's this psychological like disconnect um, where when we kind of think of it as complete and it goes out and, um, but then we get interrupted later with, hey, no, that's not quite done, right? One, we have to load that context back into our head, and then we have to, be able to rationally take critical feedback, which is hard in the best of circumstances, um, and even worse when it's something that we thought we already were kind of settled on. So what we want to do is we want to see how we can reduce the length of the feedback loop, right? We want to get to where we're getting feedback faster. So this is where um, I was kind of introduced to this idea of informal pairing. 
uh, basically, right? Instead of uh, instead of getting a code review after you know weeks or hours or weeks or hours days or weeks after we were done, um, I would just say, hey, I, I have a, either I have a problem or um, this is a little bit tricky. I'd like somebody else to come look at it. You just kind of have you know somebody come, they come and sit with you, right? And then they go away, right? And so it was mostly solo work, but occasionally you'd have somebody join you. Um, this has some advantages, right? It has this on-demand component to it, right? We're not always working together, um, but uh, but in this type of environment, um, we started to spend more time together. We started to collaborate more, which which had a lot of benefits. At this time in my career, I was also um, introduced this concept of randori. Anybody heard of randori before? So this is a form of practice. Um, the name kind of is borrowed from from martial arts. And it's this idea of kind of sparring, right? So the idea with Randori, which kind of is, what we could say, a predecessor or a kind of prototype of, uh, like a proto mob programming, is that we have um, a person at the keyboard that's driving, we have a navigator, then we have this line of people that are lined up to become the navigator. And then what happens is, at a, time increment, somebody's facilitating this, the driver leaves to become part of the audience again, the navigator now becomes the driver, and then we get a new navigator from our list, or our queue of people. Um, so, in doing this, like, it was a lot of fun, it wasn't super productive all the time. Um, we would use this for, like, training exercises or just for, like, just for fun, because the, the problem often was, though, is that this guy here um, was sometimes thinking, hey, these guys are knuckleheads. Um, when I get up there, we're going to do it how I want to do it. And so oftentimes, you would get here, and you'd be the navigator, and that person would be like, OK, delete all that code. We're going to do it my way. Um, not super productive. But it, was, um, it did teach some lessons around, like, OK, let's let's use those improv techniques of yes and, and like not just like kind of, kind of completely thinking in my own way. Um, uh, but it works, it, this structured uh, scenario like this works a lot better when you're working with a team and when you're working with random people. Because I did this a couple times at conferences, and that's where people like to just, they don't care. There's no relationships that they have to maintain. They can just kind of say whatever they want about other people's code. Um, but it kind of intrigued me, this idea of, um, like, these people over here could also give input, uh, but it just was, like, but it had to be filtered through this person that was, that was navigating. So again, I keep coming back to this question of how do we reduce the length of the feedback loop. So, um, this is kind of when I got more introduced to pair programming. Anybody here do pair programming? Okay, just a couple. Um, so, um, in the company I was in, we had pairing stations. So we all had our own cubicles that we could work on uh, doing solo work if we wanted to. But we also had pairing stations. And the idea was is that we had a pair of monitors, we had one keyboard and mouse, and we had a docking station that was out here. And you'd put your laptop in the docking station, and then you'd pull up your stuff and you'd work on it, right? Um, and you'd have a pair there with you. And we had two pairing stations set up in this this shared room that we had for our team, right? And you switch the key keyboard back and forth. It looked a lot like this. This is not a picture of our pairing stations, but it was very similar. Um, we did not have two keyboards, though. We did have one keyboard and a mouse, and then we had our, our uh, laptops hooked up to the monitors. Now, what, anyway, so, like I said, this kind of had this caves and commons idea where we had our pairing stations and then we had private work areas. Now, this is not our setup, but this is a setup that comes from uh, Alistair Coburn and Ken Hour. So, uh, but it was this idea that, you know, if you did need to retreat to your kind of own space to do solo work, you could do that, right? But as we had those kind of dedicated workstations available to us, we spent more and more time doing that. Right? It wasn't like a big, like, 
oh, I need to rearrange my desk, or we have to use my space, or do we have to use your space? It's like we have this dedicated space set aside for pair programming. So it was it made it reduced the friction a lot. Um, at this time, uh, I also started we also started doing a lot of learning time in this this particular team I was on, and we do this with the idea of one navigator, many drivers, and this is basically you know your kind of typical classroom setup, but instead of having, um, you'd have one person in front that was kind of doing their thing, and then everybody would follow along. Uh, we'll see this come up, though, later on. Uh, yeah, so, again, reducing the feedback loop. So, the thing was, is that with that, that model of having the pairing station, you still had to make a choice, and you had to find somebody else who was available to go ahead and pair with you. So, what, um, so at the next company I worked at, we embraced what we called per, persistent promiscuous pair programming. So um, it's not inappropriate promiscuity, but promiscuous in that we change pairs often. So for example, right, on one day, these two might be pair, pairing together and these two might be pairing together, and the next day, these two people might pair with the other person, right? What would happen is that, let's say, pair one here, um, they started working on something, and even if they weren't finished with it, um, let's say this person continued to want to work on that particular story, so this person would now pick it up, this person would kind of drop that story and work on whatever story this other person was working on. Um, this allowed us to exchange information very freely, right? Um, there was a lot of collaboration. There wasn't any sort of, this is my code. There was, you know, again, we're trying to get this whole team ownership of the code base. Um, the, the challenge was um, that we had a particular member of the team that's like, okay, well, yeah, we all own the code, and that's great, but... I want to finish the thing that I started, right? There are different personalities kind of react to this differently, but there was one person on our team that was very insistent that they're like, I want to start something, I want to finish something. And, and how we were working at that time didn't really facilitate that because um, how we worked is that we, uh, it wouldn't necessarily continue to follow this person, like then somebody would switch off and then this person would be the one if it took multiple days. Um, so for example, right, so like Susan and I would pair together and then on the next day Susan would then pair with Julie, Julie and, then, uh, and then Julie would continue the story and pair with Jennifer, right? And so, uh, you know, by the time, they, there's advantages to this in that you get the kind of that beginner's mind. You get fresh perspective every time you switch pairs. Um, you also, so you're not, you don't get stuck as often, but there is some ramp up time. Um, and additionally, I don't actually get to see, you know, I'm just one that started, I, and Susan neither gets to see it actually get completed. So, so there was some discussion of, well, how could we resolve this? So at that time, um, this is my friend, uh, Luan Falco, who made, some of you may be familiar with. Um, he at this time told me, you should talk to Willie Zool, you need to see what they're doing at 100 Industries. I was like, huh, okay, what, is, what are they doing? And so this is when I got introduced to Mob Program. Um, so they have a website, mobprogramming.org, where they, where they kind of blogged kind of their experiences. There's less being posted there at this point. But, um, so this is the idea of, okay, we're going to get everybody working together. So this is uh, Andrea Zool, which is Woody's wife. Uh, she's an illustrator uh, for the children's books, and so she drew this. And um, it was kind of funny and tongue-in-cheek, right, a little bit, that, you know, it's forks and torches. Um, we're talking about a mop. But, um, and so this was kind of, I actually have a t-shirt with this on it, which is actually pretty cool. But so this is how Woody described um, mob programming. So mob programming, so this is how he describes Agile, or how he interprets Agile, is that we're going to have all the brilliant people working on the same thing at the same time in the same space, right? 
Again, the co-location, we're going to focus on one thing, we're going to get it done. Um, but when he looked at my programming, he added one more thing. And this was at the same computer. So sometimes we talk about this idea of, OK, we're going to, um, when we do retrospectives or things, we say, OK, well, what went well? OK, that's great. Let's set aside the things that went well. OK, what went poorly? OK, let's focus on that and see if we can make it better. Well, the approach here was not, OK, let's look at what's wrong and make it better. It's, let's look at what's going well and see if we can turn it up to 11, right? What can, how can we make the good even better? So, um, so sometimes we refer to mock programming as, as pair programming with more than two people. Now, <coughs> this, how does this reduce the feedback loop, right? So I said, let's, I came back to my team and I'm like, okay, we're having these problems. Let's try this mock programming thing. And they're like, you know, again, in a retrospective, we said, okay, sure, we'll try it for a week and see how it goes. Um, uh, I was fortunate to have a team at that time that was very open to just like pretty much try whatever kind of crazy ideas people came up with. And, you know, again, we always said it's for a week. At the end of the week, we'll evaluate and decide if we're going to continue to do it. So here's my experiences um, mob programming. So my first mob, we had three people who were co-located and one person that was remote. And uh, we had... We were using one of those pairing stations. So again, it was a machine where we had a bunch of monitors hooked up to it. Um, and so this is kind of how we sat, right? We had one person, we had the three people that were at a pairing station. We were connected via the cloud, the internet, um, to this other person who was remote. Um, this worked out pretty well. This first experiment that we had, we worked on a we were looking to improve the search functionality of the website we were working on. And none of us had done the original implementation. None of us had any experience doing search before. None of us knew we were using solar at the time, and we had no idea like how it worked. Um, and so we are like, well, let's try it out. Um, and it worked actually really well. So um, usually how it worked out is there would be somebody who was at the keyboard. They would be the person that was kind of uh, taking commands from other people. And uh, the rest of us were basically doing research. Kind of like, hey, like, basically look for something. You say, hey, let's try this. And the person at the keyboard would be like, OK, let's put that in. And you try it out, and you get feedback. And then um, usually by the time that person would be like, oh, that was better, or that, was, that didn't work, that didn't have no effect, whatever it was that happened. Um, but usually by the time they were done kind of working, they had the next person who had researched something else was ready with another idea to come up with. So there's this very kind of cool team flow that we had going on where we were um, able to work pretty effectively during that week. And everybody was pretty happy. Um, the one member of the team that had the problem with like, hey, I want to see things done, um, he was super happy too because he, we started the thing and we ended the thing all together. Now, what happened was is that we added a team member, and this presented an interesting problem, right? So three people huddled around Perry Station was not super comfortable, but was okay. Four people huddled around the Perry Station, not so okay. Um, and then the other thing was is that the remote team member um, moved so that he was now co-located with us. So we had five people huddled around Perry Station, <laughs> not very comfortable. Um, so we're like, okay, how do we solve this? Uh, so what we did was, you know, the machine that we were working on could handle four different monitors. And so what we did is we set it up more like we had our other parent stations where we had uh, two monitors here, and then we had the same two monitors over here. Now, if any of you have done pair programming before, what is the main problem you see with pair programming? The main challenge there is? Anybody? Staying on task if you're not in the driver's seat, like staying focused on the problem? Right, so that is the most common thing I see, right? Is this, uh, the, the person who is not currently typing gets disengaged. So um, 
before, we were all there, we were all pretty engaged, but what happens when you sent two people off here remotely? Right? You probably guess what happened. They started talking about whatever they wanted to talk about, which usually was related to whatever happened over the weekend, not necessarily what was going on with the code. And um, this caused like super amounts of disengagement. These people would take their turn at the keyboard, but they were just less, they, they kind of came in, they didn't really know what was going on, and it was, it kind of um, was not very good. Let's just say that. So at the, about this time, um, I got the opportunity to go to San Diego to speak at uh, SoCal Code, Code Camp. And I went up a little bit early so that I could go. So 100 Industries is based in San Diego. Um, so this is where the original mobbers were. So I was like, okay, this is my opportunity to go. Um, they kind of had this open invitation. I still think they do to anybody that's in San Diego for like a day. You can go and you can spend time with the mob. Um, and so this is uh, from June of 2014. There I am. Uh, and this is the mob at the time. So I got to spend the day with them. Um, it was eye-opening. So a couple different things here that you can see is the wall that, from where the perspective of the camera is, you notice there's a projector here and a projector here. So they had two projectors that were basically projecting like images that I think were at least as big or if not bigger than this projector here. Um, you notice they have multiple keyboards. You notice that some people have laptops. Um, we noticed a lot of different things about how they worked. 90% uh, of the time, um, maybe 80% of the time when I was here, I was standing because you were having conversations, you were moving around, having conversations with different people. Um, sometimes, especially as the navigator, it was useful to stand up because then you projected a little bit more and everybody could hear you better. Uh, so there were a lot of little things like that that I was like, huh, okay, you know, the things we were doing were we're, we're, we're working in certain circumstances, but there were some, maybe some things that we can improve. So uh, about this time, we also switched, we moved office situations. Um, I was in a company that was growing pretty rapidly, and so we had a new office space we were moving into, so we're kind of like, let's not make major changes to what we're doing until we move there. Uh, we also rearranged the teams at that time, and so I got another opportunity um, to mop. And so we had four co-located people. Um, one of those people was the team lead, who was myself. And uh, what we were able to get were 80-inch TVs that were hung up on the wall. So, so this was our situation. Um, again, the driver would move out. You'd have somebody new move into the driver, and you just kind of whoever was uh, going to work. So this is. This is the actual place where we were. Um, this is when we moved in. Uh, these are the two TVs we used. We actually set up a clean, kind of rearranged the furniture so that we had a desk here and um, were able to look at this. Uh, this is after I left, but I asked uh, uh, this guy who still worked there at that time to do this picture for me. But um, they ended up having a second set of monitors here so that they didn't have to make this as big. I don't know how I feel about that, but um, it worked out well for them. So, okay, so I, I between those two mob situations, uh, I spent about a year mobbing. Um, and so here's some of the things I discovered during that time. Now, it's been about three years since I did that, and the last three years I've used mobbing a whole bunch more, and, it, and all of these discoveries still hold. So, um, this is really important. Um, if you've ever done pair programming, tried pair programming, and not liked it for whatever reason, um, one of the things to realize is that pair programming is not solo programming with the audience, right? That's how some people will look at it. It's like, well, you have two people. You have one person doing the work and one person watching somebody do the work. <laughs> like, if you're doing it that way, like, that is not the most effective way to pair program. So, um, pair programming requires a whole set of skills that solo programming does not. Now, a lot of your solo programming skills do come and work well in pair programming. 
um, but they are not the only skills you need, right? You need to be able to relate to another human being, which you don't need to do as much when you're solo programming. You need to be able to negotiate, okay, well, I have this idea, you have this idea, whose idea should we go with? Um, how do we, there's a lot of communication things that need to be worked out. Um, so just like that, mob programming is not solo or even pair programming with an audience. So, um, so there are, again, there are this set of different, uh, different things that are necessary for an effective mob. So physical space. Um, this is not the most important thing, but it is, it will grease the skids a lot if you have good physical space for your mob. So uh, one aspect of that is to have keyboard, right? A keyboard that people are comfortable with. Now, some people are very persnickety about their keyboards. <laughs> Do we have any people in here that are persnickety about their keyboards? Okay, right? You have some keyboard that you very much like. Um, you may have other people on your team that are, have persnickety habits about keyboards. So that second mob that I worked on, we had four people in the mob, right? Four people on our team. Um, we had five keyboards hooked up <laughs> to their machines. Right, these like we had one guy who like he soldered together his own keyboard because he's that <laughs> like into keyboards. So you know what? It costs. I mean, even the most expensive keyboards out there right now are like maybe two, three hundred dollars. Like most keyboards are going to be about a hundred, hundred fifty. Like it's so totally worth it to just make sure everybody has a keyboard that they're comfortable with. Um, so keyboards just. Most machines now have a bazillion USB ports. Get a USB hub, just plug all the keyboards in, it's fine. Um, in terms of how we work together, strong style pairing is very important. So again, going back to this whole like, okay, we're not gonna be programming, solo programming with the audience. Um, strong style pairing dictates this, the following rule that for an idea to go from your head into the computer, it must go through someone else's hands, right? So we often think of the person who is at the keyboard as the one that is, has the idea and therefore is the one that's actually programming. But with strong style, what it does is it flips that on its head. The person who is at the keyboard is not the one with the idea. So if you're at the keyboard and you have an idea, what do you do? You relinquish the keyboard to somebody else, and then you tell them what it is that you want to do. What this does a couple things. So, um, one is that it requires you to vocalize an idea. When you vocalize an idea, um, it makes it a little bit more real. Now, how many people have had an idea that sounded excellent, like the best idea ever, in your head? And then when you said it out loud, <laughs> not that great of an idea, right? So um, it helps that in that way to help filter out ideas, right? Um, but again, when you're when you're working effectively together, you're just throwing out ideas. You're not you're not necessarily worrying as much about is it the best idea. It's like I have this idea. Let's talk about it. Um, the the thing here with strong style is that. We're not asking the driver, the person at the keyboard, to be a typist, right? They are the one typing, but we're not saying, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do and you're going to follow my instructions like a robot. At that point, like, there are programs like Dragon Naturally Speaking and things like that that can take commands at that level. In this, in this case, what we're doing is we want to talk at the highest level of abstraction that the driver can handle. So for instance, um, I might be at the level of, hey, we need to write a test that tests for X, Y, Z, right? And that is perhaps the person who's at the keyboard is like, okay, I know what to do. I'm gonna go do it, right? We call this intent. We start with the intent. We wanna stay in intent as much as we can. But if we need to, if for example, the person that's at the keyboard is less experienced, um, I may need to dive into location, which means I might be like, oh, okay, we'll need to uh, go to this file and go to line 72, right? Um, pro tip for if you're ever doing pair programming or mob programming, 
turn on my numbers, please. This is like super critical. Yeah. Um, this is a great way to communicate about your code is to, instead of going like below this, whatever, like no, just line numbers. Um, so that helps a lot with location. And you might get to the level of detail, right? So um, for example, uh, I've mob programmed with a team that was doing, I, I normally do C Sharp and TypeScript and we went and worked with a team that was doing Java. And Java is using some framework that I'd never seen before. I didn't know anything, right? So um, when it was my turn to be at the keyboard with this, with this group, I had to get a lot more direction, a lot more detail, um, down to the like, sometimes exactly what to type. And that's okay sometimes too. The thing is, is that you want to make sure if you need to zoom into detail, that as soon as that person kind of has a handle on it, you want to zoom back out to intent. Um, and sometimes the person who is the driver may ask for that. They may say, hey, I need some more detail. And that's okay, right? Um, like, and sometimes it's, let's not even like figure out what the intent is. Just tell me what to type, let's go. And both modalities are important. The, sometimes it's good to negotiate, sometimes it's good to just go with it. But again, what we ideally wanna do is get to, at a point after we've worked like this for a while, is get to where we're just talking an intent. And detail is, is not super common, right? Because again, if you tell me how to do something once as a driver, um, hopefully the next time, I would be able to tie whatever you said is the intent to whatever it is I need to do with the keyboard. Uh, another component um, that I, we found is the idea of using a timer. So the original Hunter mob, um, how they actually got started is they decided they were gonna work on uh, designing a new part of their system together. And so they got together in a conference room, like you do, and they started whiteboarding stuff. And they had like, I think about 20 minutes left in their meeting time uh, that they had. And so they're like, well, you know, instead of going back and somebody who's like, who's gonna implement this? Why don't we just try implementing it together? Um, because we're not entirely sure that even our design that we came up to put together is gonna work. So they put it up on a projector, they started working, and excuse me, and it, worked out really well to the point where they um, were not able to reserve that conference room, but they went and they found another conference room and reserved that for an hour. And they kind of did this until they realized that, hey, we need some dedicated space, and then that, that's the space that you saw in the photo where I was with them. Um, the thing was is that they would find that oftentimes somebody who was at the keyboard would kind of get stuck at the keyboard. Um, either because nobody's kind of remembered or that person got so comfortable or whatever the reason was. So they decided to try a couple different things. Um, first thing they tried was they brought in just a regular kitchen timer, right? Put, put however much time on it, click go. Um, but those kitchen timers, what do they do at the end? They ding. They beep. Usually pretty loud, right? Um, so if you notice back in that photo, they were in the middle kind of of a cube farm. Like the rest of the people on that floor, not so happy about getting kitchen timer every five, 10, 15, whatever minutes. So what, what they did, um, the other thing that they saw was that um, when the timer went off, right, it probably beeped like three or four times or they just hit the snooze or whatever, they hit it off. It's very easy to ignore that. And so they would sometimes just blow right past whatever they were using as a timer. So they went ahead and they built their own timer app. And what this does is it will, you put in this one, you put in like the names of the people, and then you say go, and then it'll say, this is the person who's supposed to be at the keyboard, this is the person that's on deck, and it'll show the timer in the corner. Now, what happens is when the timer gets up is it will actually pull basically this screen back up and say, it's time for the next person, which allows you, like, it's just enough interruption for our brains to be like, okay, okay, I'll let somebody else go to the keyboard. Now you could always just click through and say, yeah, I'm just gonna stay at the keyboard, but there was enough of an interruption that people wouldn't necessarily do that. So, um, so this is one of the mob, the mob timers they came up with. Um, this is another one that I discovered uh, about a year or two ago called Mobster. Um, this is the one we use now at Greater Sum, and it's pretty cool. Um, I have a link to it at the end. Um, so, timers, 
super important. Uh, again, you don't have to use a timer. Um, I've had, I've worked in, sometimes we work as a mob without a timer, and that's fine too. Um, for me, the, mob, the timer's kind of like a guide rail, guard rail, right? It keeps you on the path, it helps you to remember to rotate, otherwise sometimes we forget. Okay, so how long do we set that timer for, right? Um, one of the things that we discovered was the hard work was not when you're at the keyboard, right? Um, right? The keyboard is not the bottleneck. Now, we get to where the keyboard can be the bottleneck if we have enough people on our mob, but the hard work wasn't when you're at the keyboard. If you were relatively experienced at what you did, right? If you were just a typist, then it could be very stressful to be at the keyboard. But in general, it wasn't like, the keyboard wasn't the hard part. Keyboard, the hard part was coming up with the ideas, kind of keeping things moving. Um, and so what we discovered with timing is that, let's say, sorry, your name? Jenny. Jenny and Thomas and Noah, let's say we're working on a, on a mob team, right? So let's say we set the timer at 15 minutes, right? Okay, so I'm at the keyboard for 15 minutes. You're at the keyboard for 15 minutes. You're at the keyboard for 15 minutes. You're at the keyboard for 15 minutes. So while I'm not at the keyboard, how long am I not at the keyboard? 45, 45 minutes. minutes. That's a long time to be cognitively loaded in thinking about the problem. So if we take that down to 10 minutes, then it's only 30 minutes. And if you know your Pomodoro stuff, right, theory, that like about 25 minutes is usually about as long as we can like super intensely focus on something. Um, if we go against shorter, right, if we do five minutes, then it's only about 15 minutes. And so by lowering the amount of time we're at the keyboard, one, we're keeping ourselves more engaged. Um, if you uh, are familiar with like training from the back of the room stuff, like movement uh, is a big thing. And so again, getting up out of your seat, moving around, is, is super helpful for keeping your brain active. Um, which again, sorry, we're not doing here today. So just kind of keep with it. Okay, so again, the hard work is not when you're at the keyboard. So again, lowering the amount of time on a timer, even though it felt somewhat disrupt, can feel somewhat disruptive initially to be like, oh, I'm at the keyboard for only a little bit of time. It becomes more, more, uh, more natural as you, as you switch more frequently. Um, one thing we realized is we didn't need to have stand-ups anymore. Um, what's the purpose of a stand-up? Share knowledge. Right, share knowledge, right? Coordinate the work of the team, make sure we, we know what everybody's working on, help unblock other people. Well, if we're all working together, the need for a stand-up kind of melts away. Now, it depends on what other external parties you have involved with uh, that are not part of your mob on a daily basis, but. Um, in general, like your stand-ups can be radically transformed because you don't need to be talking about a lot of the things that you would normally talk about in a stand-up, right? We just come in in the morning, we'd be like, okay, what were we working on yesterday? Oh, there we are, okay, let's go. And it wasn't like a whole ceremony, as it were. Um, we did the just-in-time code design, right? So instead of Instead of having some sort of meeting weekly where we would design or think about how to, how to work on features, um, you just pull the feature, you look at it, you'd say, okay, do we need to talk about this? And we'd just start working on it. If we needed to, we could just all go over to the whiteboard, whiteboard up what we needed to, and, and just keep moving. Um, right, one of the, the biggest challenges is oftentimes you have those like design meetings together, and then the person who actually has to go implement it goes back to their work and then they run into something that wasn't anticipated, right? What do you do at that point? Do you pull everybody back together? Or do you just kind of like, well, I'm just gonna make a decision on my own, right? Usually you just kind of make a decision on your own because you don't want to interrupt everybody else's work. Um, with mob programming, you're not interrupting other people's work because it is the work that everybody is doing. So again, you get more input from everybody and you can get the best out of everybody more easily. Uh, another thing is the, the lottery factor. Anybody heard of this before? I've heard it called bus factor. So it's often referred to more morbidly as a bus factor. Um, the idea is, is that how many members of your team could win the lottery 
and you would not, you know, what you lose pieces of information, right? Obviously, you don't ever want to lose anybody in your team um, because there are unique things that those people bring. But again, you don't want to be to where, um, where if somebody were to leave, you would feel like incapacitated as a team for like three months while you try to figure stuff out, right? It's like. Well, Bobby, he's the only one that knows that part of the system. And Sarah, she's the only one that knows this part of the system. And if we lose any, either of those, then it's going to take us a whole bunch of time to ramp up. Right? Again, we're trying to bring down that. Well, while we are trying to get the best from everybody, we're also trying to not have be overly reliant on any one person. Um, so this was super, super useful for that. Um, it made us more resilient as a team, which is kind of like the lottery factor, but um, in that we were resilient to vacations, right? Sometimes, like, you might still want to work at the company, but you do want to take a vacation for maybe a week or two. Uh, and if um, Billy was the one that, like, really knew a piece of the system, what do you often do when Billy goes on vacation? What? Wait till he comes back. You wait till he comes back. So that's like usually what happens. Sometimes you try to like, like Billy tries to spend like a frantic like hour or two like here's here's how to kind of yeah. work on this part of the system before I leave. Mm -hmm. Or and then usually it's like well that'll take me like you know a couple days to ramp up and then by that time I might as well wait for Billy to come back, right? So. Um, we didn't have those situations, right? We were not scared to work on any part of the system because we had all worked on all of the code together. Um, we're also resilient to meetings. So for instance, I as the team lead in that second mob, we would, I'd often have to go off and meet with different people within the company um, to coordinate different work. And uh, when I'd been in that position and, a, and we were pair programming, like my pair even would be like, okay, well, what do I do for like an hour or two while you're gone? Because um, we had kind of a working agreement that we were not going to work on any production code without a pair. So again, uh, it just made us more resilient to those types of things. Um, this is an interesting one in that because we had more inputs and because we were focused on only one thing at a time, it made sure that we were working on the right thing. We had more, dis a little bit more discussion about, okay, is this what we really should be working on? Um, it also helped clarify our discussions with, uh, with external to the team stakeholders of what is it that you really want us to work on? Because we're going to be working on that one thing. It's not like, well, we're going to send off, um, you know, Sally into the corner and she's going to work on it, and everything else you want to get done is still going to get done simultaneously, maybe in parallel, like, this is what we're going to work on. Is that really the thing that you want that, that's the highest value right now? Um, and more than anything, we got things done and delivered, right? You weren't waiting on, well, I need a code review or I need um, Jim to test it or, um, you know, we were all responsible for the testing. We'd write the, the, the testing. We write the automated tests together. We do whatever manual testing we need to do. We might talk to a product owner to get, you know, final buy-off and things like that. But, you know, we were responsible for all those things, and we would actually get things done and delivered actually out to production, which was really satisfying as a team. Um, we had frequent retrospectives. So uh, most people have them at what a sprint cadence or maybe at a weekly or bi-weekly cadence. Um, so we would still have like, I think we were doing like every week, we would do like a bigger retrospective. But basically, especially early on when we were mob programming, we would have them at least every day. Like we would kind of end the day with, okay, how did today go? What things can we adjust? You know, and so we made a lot of adjustments around, okay, bring in more keyboards. Um, let's move the desk this way. Let's see if we can get a different situation with the, the TVs or whatever. Um, again, and again, we were constantly iterating, and so we were always getting better at what we were doing. Um, we weren't kind of like, oh, well, it's not going to work, so leave it alone. We had a retrospective, and we made changes. Okay, so I've gone through all of these wonderful, magical things that happen when you mob program. 
So the question is, Mike, what is the downside? And the answer are there are downsides. I'm not going to say there aren't any. Um, one thing is you have less work time flexibility, right? So suddenly, um, if uh, if Kim wants to come in early and leave at like two or three in the afternoon, that doesn't really work as much with the team because we're kind of having these core hours where we're mobbing together. Um, you know, so you have to kind of figure out, okay, if you're going to try to support some sort of flexibility, how is it that you're going to support that? Um, one of the primary weird things is it looks funny from the outside. Like we'd have sales guys come to our office and they'd be like, so what are you doing? You know, like, and it looks like you're not really working because you're talking, you know, and there's kind of the stereotype that unless you're typing and heads down with the headphones on, rocking out, right, that that's, that's how programmers are working. It's not, not this like talking and collaborating thing. And so, um, so from that perspective, it could be a little bit difficult. Uh, both a positive and negative is that it, because of how we were working, it did invite interruptions, right? It invited people to actually like come and talk to us and, and like, uh, so that could, you know, again, you have to like balance that, but it was kind of good in that we actually had people talking to us and it, you know, made it so that we weren't like these programmers off in, again, off in their cubes, like not almost inhuman, right? Um, so, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we had this, um, we introduced product management at this time, and this is not an indictment on product management as a discipline, but our the specific product manager that I got assigned to our team um, was not really open to collaborating with us, and it kind of, we had to kind of adjust some of the things to how we worked. Um, so it is important, uh, so with product management, it can often work super well. Um, again, if the product manager is willing to be available to the team, and uh, the product manager doesn't necessarily have to be with the mob all the time, but it is great if they are accessible to the mob whenever they need to, um, need to be. In the case of Woody and the Hunter mob, they had basically an SLA with the product owner, product manager, I guess, of that team. And basically, if they were working with somebody and they were in charge of the product, if they did not answer their question like within 10 minutes or so, they were not available, they would stop working on whatever it was that they had a question on, they'd move on to the next thing. And then they would come back to that once it got prioritized again. So that kind of, um, you know, this wasn't something that they said, you will do this. It was something they negotiated together. But they kind of were like, it was a way to make sure that they didn't get blocked for extended periods of time. And so they were always getting feedback, which was really, really useful. So again, you have to kind of work, figure out how, uh, you know, as Josh put it yesterday, the whole, the, the extended product community, um, how you interact with them and how that, that, that works. Um, okay, so. So I had the first two mobs, and this is mob number three. So this is at the company that I'm currently uh, co-founder at. It's called Greater Sum. Um, so we use mob programming in a couple different ways. Um, one is we do on-site workshops with our clients. Um, and so we have uh, different techniques we use there. Um, we do workshops at our own location. And then we also have just for everyday work. So we do some client work where we do custom software work for them. So. Uh, so we talked about like one navigator, many drivers. Um, we don't do that anymore. So now we do everything with one navigator, at the very least many pairs, right? So you have one person at the front, but then you have pairs at each station that would be responsible for kind of following along. Usually what you have is you have the navigator in this situation is watching what's going on up here and then dictating to the person that they're working with, kind of helping them out. Um, and then those two people are switching who is at the driver's seat. Um, here's an actual way that it looks. Um, in this case, what we did is we, uh, I did a demo, and then each of these pairs were then going through an exercise afterwards in pairs. Um, when you're ever in the learning situation, pairing is 
super useful. Now, there are some people that say pair programming is not for mentor-teacher relationships, uh, or like mentor-student relationships, which in this case it isn't, right, because I'm not, like, these are not teachers teaching the other person, but they're teaching each other, and they're learning together, and they're collaborating, which is super, super useful. Um, so another modality we use is one navigator, many mobs. So we kind of call this person here, they're kind of like the rear admiral, right? There's the navigator and the driver, and then there's the rear admiral that's kind of um, navigating the navigators. Uh, so you can see here, right? So you have a driver at each table, but then you have somebody at each table that's designated as a navigator, and they're again the one that's following along um, with what the rear admiral is doing in the back. Um, projected on this screen over here, and it allows for, again, more people to stay engaged. Um, people tend to stay more engaged if they're, they're, more, they're just more actively involved in the process, right? Um, this is a way to get to, so, so one of the things that, that there's advantage of using mobs instead of pairs is that you kind of can equalize out different typing speeds and techniques. Um, just one thing we've noticed with the, the workshops that we do. Uh, so these are some of our former uh, coworkers, but what we do is we do mob programming. Um, here's an early uh, version of our team doing mob programming. Um, so we have an apprenticeship program, and so people will come in and then they leave after about eight to 12 months, which is why you'll see a bunch of different people in here over the last three years. Um, so this was the situation, the setup that we uh, moved to at some point, and with the two TVs, uh, two tables, you notice it looks a lot like Woody's original setup. Um, we have a bunch of keyboards, we have a bunch of uh, laptops, um, some people are standing, some people are in the back. This is a little bit of a posed photo, I think. We did this while it was gone. <laughs> um, it's, you know, uh, this is how we would work. Um, here's another situation and another one. So you can see there's this group here and then there's another group in the back. We, at one point, had two different moms working simultaneously. Um, you know, so we did have, we have some space between them, so there's not a lot of crosstalk, but, um, but if you did need to like, hey, you're the one that worked on this last, like, hey, can you come over and join us for a little bit to help with it? Okay, so I talked a lot about that driver and navigator role. Um, so one question you might be having is what about those other people, right? Like, a lot of things that I've mentioned have been, okay, the driver does this, the navigator does this. What do the rest of the mobbers do? So, um, again, Andrew's picture early on. This is kind of the picture of mopper ramming. Uh, <coughs> later on, Woody started to use this picture to talk about mopper ramming. Mm -hmm. Because um, it is more about collaboration, working together. You know, notice they're all trying to build this bridge together. Um, you know, these people are off kind of doing a little bit of research on, on bridges back there, and you know, they're all kind of working together. And so, uh, uh, so this is the result of the work of Willem Larson. Uh, Willem is based in Portland. Um, he worked with the Hunter Mob for a couple years, and he still does remotely now. Uh, what he came up with, he he approached his time at Hunter kind of like an anthropologist. He wanted to, he saw that mob programming was effective, but he wanted to understand and break down what were the specific behaviors that were making mobs more or less effective. <clears throat> and so what he found were that there were a bunch of roles that people would take on. Now these are not like persistent roles. These aren't like something that you hold on to for like the length of your career. But they are roles that you move into and out of that happen as part of an effective mob. And so, uh, if you want more detail on this, uh, you can go to uh, the Mob Programming Role Playing Game. It's all on GitHub. Um, you can dig into all about each of the different roles. How you're actually supposed to do it is you're supposed to play it as a game where you work as a team and you kind of level up. Um, you get experience points. I don't think I have it on here. Um, you have experience points for each of the different types of positions or roles that you can be in. You earn them 
different <coughs> experience points by doing different behaviors, and then you can level up and try out different uh, different roles. And so it's a way to kind of learn different behaviors that are effective as part of mob programming. So for example here, right, you have a generic mobber, but you have researcher, right? Somebody who's gonna go and uh, look up stuff, probably on their own laptop or, or some other device. Um, sponsor is somebody who helps to call out other people, people that maybe are quiet or people that aren't, um, so not maybe call out, but like encourage them to speak and to like draw out ideas from them. Uh, Rear Admiral, again, is that idea of like, maybe the architect comes in and has some grander vision, but doesn't necessarily need to be the one that's navigating at the lower level. Um, the automationist is looking for opportunities to automate things. So that might be, hey, we've, we've done the same thing three times, maybe there's a template that we can build. Or, uh, hey, um, there's keyboard shortcuts that we can be using in order to be more effective here. The nose is uh, focused on code smells. So they're the one that's kind of stepped back and kind of looking at the overall picture and kind of, okay, well maybe there's something smelly here, maybe we can rearrange this and, and can be proposing refactoring. And the archivist is oftentimes you do need to be documenting things. And so maybe they're the one that is op updating the wiki based off of some change you're making in the code or potentially uh, reminding the team, hey, you know, this is a public API, so we need to re update the Java docs or whatever it is. So again, there's these different roles that you can embody as part of the model. So I showed you Hunter Industries early on. Um, this is, oh, this is still maybe another year or two, year, year old or so, but this is what Hunter looks like now in terms of their modding. So they now have, they float between six and eight mobs. Um, notice they, they've gone to three monitors, so that's pretty cool. But you notice that they have mobby station here, mobby station here, they have a bunch of different mobby stations. Over here you have those kind of individual workstations where you can work on uh, you know, things that maybe you need to do solo. Uh, in this picture, isn't pictured there over here? There is um, kind of like a walled off, semi-private offices for the product owners, or product managers, and so the product managers are readily available. They're right there, um, but they're not, and they can come out and work with the teams, and they they often will. Um, and so, mobbing can actually scale. Um, it's not something that you need to. It's not just one team, but you can have multiple different. Uh, teams mobbing simultaneously. So again, if we go back to those original four things um, at the beginning of my journey that I looked at in terms of uh, code, code reviews, these are all things that you very powerfully get as part of mob programming and more effectively with faster feedback, right? You're getting at least people, three people reading the code. You, if the programmer leaves a project, it's not that big of a deal. Um, it can be impactful, but it's not like, deadly, um, right? The programmer knows that the code's gonna be read by others because right as soon as it comes up, there'll be at least a couple people there reading the code. And you develop a group coding standard because you're not gonna have people that are flipping back and forth between coding standards um, as you're mobbing. So, at the beginning I said mob programming is not solo programming, right? This is very true, and hopefully it has come through that that is not, not true. Um, and I often describe mob programming again as like pair of more than two people. But while that's a way to communicate it to others, um, how I've come to see it is that pair programming is like mob programming with just two people. A lot of the things that I've learned um, through my practice of mob programming is when I've needed to um, help be, me, be, more, be more effective as a pair programmer. And, uh, and even as a solo programmer, just in terms of knowing what it is that I need to get some external help. So, hopefully I've gone through stuff that's been useful to you. The biggest thing though with mob programming to remember is that it's fun, right? Being collaborative, working together, it's a lot of fun. Um, you get to know your, you get to know your teammates. It, it eliminates the need to have like, very awkward team building activities because you're actually working together as a team and you're building the team as you're building the product, which is, which is really powerful. Um, here are a bunch of resources if you want to take a picture. Otherwise, you can also grab my slides off of my website, which I'll have in the last slide. But um, 
Oh yeah, coming up in April, I guess, you can have again. There is a Bob Ferrier conference in Boston. Uh, I've attended the last two years. It's been going for three years now. And it is, if you're interested in mobbing, or if you're doing mobbing, or if you're doing pairing and want to get into mobbing, it's a great way to, to get uh, connected with like-minded individuals. And so, and this is me. If you want the slides, they are available on my website, blog.softwareontheside.com. And if you have any questions, I will take those afterwards. Otherwise, um, thank you and hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.